Greetings, we are so glad you decided to join us today. Let us go into the sanctuary.
God bless you and thank you for joining me on today. I am excited and I'm still on the high from the Charles E. Booth Preaching Conference. Let's give the Lord a hand praise for that. And thank you for those of you who joined us for that conference. Listen, these are crucial and critical times for which we're living. And today, I'm going to be bringing you a teaching about the pandemic that we are existing in, but also our call to grow in the midst thereof. God is calling the church to grow even in the midst of a pandemic. I pray that you would share this message, that you would call someone and ask them to watch it with you as we deal with growing in the midst of a pandemic. I hope that this teaching would be a blessing to you. And more than that, I hope that you would put the principles to work and watch your own life grow in the midst of a pandemic. I'll see you in just a few moments. And don't forget, I pray that you would engrow this teaching on today. God bless you.
Oh, come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Praise God bless you. And I am so excited and thankful to be able to come and share with you. Can we give your illustrious pastor and leader a tremendous hand? Thank God for him, the entire First Family. We're praying for the First Family, and we're praying for you. I am so thankful to be able to come and share with you during this particular hour. And I want to talk about something that I believe is going to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. I, I want to talk about uh, foundational principles for church growth in a pandemic. That's right. Foundational principles for church growth in a pandemic. Before we get started, I want you to visit my bookstore, SirWalterMac.com, and I want you to go out there and peruse the books that we have. And don't forget to get your copy of our latest book, my mother's book, before you go to the hospital. That's right. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Praise for that before you go to the hospital. And we'll be doing some teaching out of this as well. But I want you to make sure that you get that copy of that book and go to SirWalterMacDonald.com and you can get that and along with other writings. Let's now talk about uh, preparing the church for growth and getting foundational principles for church growth in a pandemic. I want you to know that all of us have been impacted by this pandemic. And when you consider how this pandemic has impacted all of us, we are not just dealing with one pandemic, but in fact, we're dealing with several pandemics at one time. We're dealing with a disease pandemic. Now we have millions who have been impacted by this disease globally. And once we got over COVID-19 or we were getting through COVID-19, here comes the Delta virus. Now we're dealing with this Delta variant of the virus and many are, are, are sick today and many are going through that particular illness because of this Delta variant. And there are other variants that are on the way. That's why I'm purporting that as many people as possible need to be vaccinated and we need to mask up. Somebody say amen for that. Now, we're dealing with a disease pandemic, but not only that, we are dealing with a family pandemic. Because what this pandemic did for us is that this pandemic caused for us to have to deal with some family matters that we typically were able to escape prior to the pandemic. So then you had family issues that were coming along because people were now quarantined together. And there were family matters that were coming through and coming up that we had to address and deal with. And so you had siblings that were fighting. You had couples who were dealing with unresolved issues and in the home, we had our own form of a pandemic. Not only did we have a family pandemic, but we faced a food pandemic. This pandemic hit every socioeconomic level that we can think of. This was a pandemic that had people driving Mercedes Benz and BMWs in the, in the line waiting on food boxes because restaurants were closed down and, and we could not go out to eat. And so we had to survive the best way we could. And would you not know that just recently, uh, DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub just reported that from April of last year to September of 2020 of last year, uh, they earned some $5.5 billion, two times the amount of money that they earned because of this pandemic. While some were starving, others were making a great deal of profit from the pandemic. And then not to mention the political pandemic, where we have in our nation there seems to be a divided nation. And this divide has taken on a division even with mask and political party. We had a, a possible or an attempted takeover on January the 6th. And that is said to be repeated again. 
I want you to know that what happened on January the 6th is just a foretaste of what some desired to happen for the next four years had the election not turned out the way that it did. That's why we as a nation need to pray for our nation against the hostility and against the, the, the maliciousness and the vileness that is taking place. As a matter of fact, I think we ought to pray right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray for peace in our land and we pray, oh God, that you would heal our land of any strife and any malice. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, receive that and let us say amen. So then we had the political pandemic that took place and not only the political pandemic, but then we also had a discrimination pandemic. If you remember back when this pandemic first hit, this came right in line with the George Floyd um, saga and the tragedy of George Floyd. I want you to know that discrimination is still real. If you will look at that photo right there uh, with Goldilocks and the Three Bears, how many of you remember Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Uh, you would know that in that story, Goldilocks broke in their house. But if you look at this picture, what you will find is that the three bears have been arrested and Goldilocks is telling the story to the officers. That is the reality today that so many are still being mistreated and, and, um, and, 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 and mishandled all because of race and skin color. And so there was a discrimination pandemic and that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter and social justice movement. And some people have been angry at those with the Black Lives Matter. And um, even some who are of African-American uh, culture um, don't understand this entire young um, movement. But I want you to know some say, well, why did they have to go outside of the church uh, to get started. Black Lives Matter was really the first social movement in this way that started outside of the church. Most of our civil rights movement started right there in the church. But the Black Lives Matter movement started outside of the church and perhaps it started outside the church because the church was not outside getting anything started. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> All right, and so you had these group of young people who were tired of police brutality and tired of, of being mistreated and tired of looking at the plight in their communities and decided to march. Somebody said, what is the difference between Black Lives Matter and two black people killing each other in the streets? There is a difference. Um, black Lives Matter was a movement that started against state-sponsored brutality, um, against um, those who have license or, or those who have badges uh, should not be brutalizing our people, all right? But then you have two little brothers or two sisters on the street who are fighting and who may take one another's lives and that should not be and we need to pray against that kind of violence. But what they are, are fighting against is in some way a system of oppression, but then they may have an alt uh, over some tennis shoes or video game. That's different from state-sponsored brutality. Are you hearing me? So then you had the rise of, of that. And then in the midst of all of that, we had the pandemic of mental illness, depression, and all kind of mental illness came into play during this pandemic. And so then now, while mental illness was taking place and there is nothing wrong with admitting that you need somebody to talk to, I am one that believes that prayer and um, therapy goes together. I believe that theology and therapy goes together. Amen, somebody. Um, but then you had this mental illness rise that was a pandemic in and of itself. And then watch this, while all of this is happening, we had to shut down our churches. We had to close down our churches and many churches, even to this day, have not opened. Our church presently is not meeting uh, physically um, because we believe that we want to keep our people safe with a very high positivity rate. Uh, we believe that this is the safest route for us to go. We have faith. We love God. We're still saved. 
But we believe that this is the safest route for us to go. Other churches may make their own decisions and choice, and so be it. But I want you to know that many churches shut down in the midst of all of this, and it forced us to have worship in our own homes. I mean, it forced us to have to go on our computers and our iPads and we worship God in spirit and in truth. We turned our living rooms into our sanctuaries. We turned our, our, our bedrooms into our shouting rooms. And we, we really had our secret clauses right there with us. I wish I had somebody who knew what I was talking about. Yes, this pandemic forced us to worship God right where we were. And I want you to know that, that I found a video of a young brother who was just driving in his car and had church all by himself because that's what we had to do in the midst of this pandemic. Watch this brother worship right here. Come on in here. <laughs> Come on, get your praise on. Woke up this morning, got out of my bed, and looked around. This is what I said. Uh, come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. That brother is having church all by himself. So then now, watch this. This pandemic hit us. And we're dealing with it on many fronts. But in the midst of all that's happening, the church is still called to grow. I want you to know when we talk about church growth, we're not just talking about physical growth. We're not just talking about um, the growth that you can measure with the eye, but we're talking about spiritual growth. We're talking about moral growth. We're talking about emotional growth. We're talking about financial growth. In the midst of a pandemic, the church is still called to produce and to grow. That's what revival is all about. Revival is about a time for us to, to measure ourselves with God and, and to see where we are in reference to where God desires us to be. And if we look at it, all of us still have some growing to do. So then let's talk about why it is that the church needs to grow. You look right there. And you'll find that Tom Rainer, a researcher of the church, um, in his book, Leading a Post-COVID Church, talks about some of the realities that they're finding about churches even today, some who have already returned back. And here's, what, uh, here's what they discovered of some of the churches who have returned into worship or in worship. Um, here's some of the findings that they found. One, that some churches are still as pre-stagnant today as they were before the pandemic. In other words, there have been churches who have gone through an entire pandemic and have not changed one iota. I want you to know that Gardner C. Tiller said something that if you gotta go through something, you ought to get something out of it. How is it that you can look around and you see 680,000 people dead and, and more people right in this nation that are dying and our churches remain stagnant and the same. Sameness could be the introduction to sin because we refuse to change and to do something different. God is always uh, uh, changing not his substance, but how he manifests himself always changes. In the Old Testament, he shows up in theophanies and, and things like fire and a still small voice. And then in the New Testament, he shows up uh, uh, in a body, wrapped in a body in flesh. And, and then in the, in the book of Acts, he shows up by way of spirit. I like the way, I like the way 
uh, one theologian put it, one theologian said, in the Old Testament, we see God before skin. In the New Testament, we see God with skin. And then by the book of Acts, we see God in skin. He's always changing, but his substance remains the same. How is it that our churches refuse to change after a pandemic? Then they reported that less than 50 percent of the population in America is religious. And this is down from 70% just 20 years ago. Then look at this, 60% of Americans will not step inside of a church or a synagogue this year. And not only that, but 24% of Americans even consider themselves as churchgoers. You mean to tell me you saw death right there in your eyes. You you faced death. You saw family members dying. You saw friends dying. You saw church members dying. And you're still not convinced that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Say of the Lord. I want you to know that we are in a place where we must be determined that the church must grow. Look at this picture that they're painting. They said that one of the researchers found that that after the pandemic, they found that those who are returning back to church in some places, complainers are still complaining. That lets me know that COVID can't even stop some people from complaining. Help me, Holy Ghost. That you mean to tell me that you survived COVID and you went through all of that and you still mad about the color of the carpet and, and the, 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 the stained glass windows in the church and, and that you did not get recognized and nobody called your name and you didn't get a certificate, you didn't get called or you didn't get selected to lead the group. You mean to tell me you're still dealing with, dealing with that petty stuff and we have just overcome a pandemic like this complainers are still complaining this is the finding among those churches that have already returned back to worship but then it says that in the midst of this and this is why we need growth that 40 percent of churches have sustained financially better than expected and that technology giving is expected to be here and to soar now, here's the deal. God has blessed our ministry. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. God has blessed you that you've been able to tithe and give and support in the midst of all of these pandemics that we were facing. You were still able to support your ministry. But if you were not, this is an area for you to grow in because in the midst of a pandemic, you still have to grow and you still have to sow and you still are obligated to keep God's command. So then now let's talk about how do we grow? Um, what are the principles of growth as we talk about growing as a church in the midst of a pandemic? First of all, uh, I want you to know that Mark Twain said something that struck me some time ago. And uh, Mark Twain said, the rumor of my death has been grossly exaggerated. Help me, Holy Ghost. Can I tell you that the reason that I am more determined to grow now than ever is because what was intended to kill me did not kill me. But I have survived and come through whatever the enemy had in store to stop me, I have already overcome it. Would you please give God a hand praise and thank God that the rumor against your life and the rumor of your death has been death, has been grossly exaggerated. And aren't you glad that what they said would not survive, did survive? Aren't you glad that you survived? Aren't you glad that people you prayed for survived? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. And yes, we are sensitive to those who lost loved ones in this pandemic. There are times when the Lord does call us home and give us rest from all of this turmoil and all of this trouble and all of this sickness. But then there are times when God will say to you, I'm not done with you yet. 
And I need you to get back in the fight. And I need you to stay there because I'm raising you up as a testimony that my power is still real. I wish I had some help. I'm all I'm trying to tell y'all is this, that that the rumor of my death has grossly been exaggerated. Some people thought the church would die. But I see it as an opportunity for the church to grow, develop, and expand. And as a matter of fact, I want you to know that one projection, one projection is that by 2022, that numbers will begin to come back to the church. Come on, y'all. Somebody said that as we, if we return right now, that we will return looking at 30 percent less of people. But can I tell you that I thank God for the new projection that by 2022, the, the projection is that numbers are going to start coming back to the church from the north, the south, the east and the west. I thank God that there's a remnant of him, of those who have not heard of him yet, that want to hear of him and experience the fullness of his power. If you can't wait to get back to church, you ought to just give God a hand praise right where you are and say, I can't wait to, to come back or move forward, should I say. Move forward, yes. Yes, we're not going back, we're moving forward with what God has called us to do. Then I want you to know that growth must be intentional. Now, if you look at that picture right there, uh, you see those high water plant pans. I remember uh, when I was coming through grade school um, that it was, you were the last in stock if you showed up to school in high water pants. <laughs> um, and the children would say, to you, if you got to school in high water pants, hey, you need to pull your shoes up. <laughs> but I want you to know this, that the reason that I put that picture there is because when you're growing as a teenager, as an adolescent, you never see yourself grow. You never see yourself move from five foot one to five foot three, to five foot eight, to six foot two. You never see yourself growing. If somebody has seen yourself grow, I want to meet you. Because the truth of the matter is, we never see ourselves grow. We just wake up and one day, what used to be small or fit us properly is now small and can't fit us anymore. What used to be a perfect fit is no longer a perfect fit because we have grown. That's how growth is in God. You don't see yourself growing. You don't see yourself becoming what God wants you to become. You just know that what they did to you last year, if they did it, if they do it to you this year, uh, it didn't have the same effect on you that it did last year. It used to make you cry, but it doesn't make you cry. Now, that's growth. It used to make you say some words that you can't say in church, but you don't say that now. When they hurt you, you pray for them instead of curse them. That's growth. You didn't see yourself growing. You just, you just woke up and you saw and you felt differently. You, you approached life differently. When the circumstance hap happened, you handled it differently. That's growth. So then now, growth happens. But then there's a time when growth has to be intentional. Um, that, that's, what, that's what we find in the store Target. If you look at the history of Target and what they've done over the past five years has been absolutely amazing. Um, I like to read and keep up with what's happening with companies and apply those to the movement and growth of the church. Because in 2014, Target was literally a, a company that had distressed stock. Um, nobody wanted to really deal with Target. They were dying like the other dinosaurs. They, they were 
the old school model with large box stores and where you could come in and get the items that you needed. And, and, um, and then many of these stores were empty because people were no longer shopping in that way. Um, their revenues were down and Amazon was hitting their bull's eye every time they, 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 they hit a click. They were killing Target, along with other stores like J.C. Penney and Sears and other stores. But the CEO of Target recognized something, that if we are going to survive, we got to make a shift. We can't continue to do what we're doing and survive. We got to make a shift. And so the first thing he did is that he moved the top leadership tier of his team on the same executive floor because he discovered that there was a disconnect in their communication. My, 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 my. I want you to know that if we are going to sustain and survive as a ministry, the enemy is going to attack how we communicate and how we channel the vision of God. And so then he moved everybody on the same floor. And don't you know that when they made shifts with strategy, their, their revenue began to take off and soar. And I want you to look at that graph right there. I want you to know that Target and Home Depot, um, they began to just soar in financial revenue while J.C. Penney and Sears had to shut down. What was the difference? What was the difference? Uh, Target came up with a strategy, and here was the strategy that they came up with. One, the strategy was that we are going to meet people where they are. So they came up with a curbside service where you can order, stay in your car, and they will bring the item to you. Then they came up with Shipped. Shipped is that new app, that new formulation where you can order what it is you want and you have your own personal shopper that will go and shop for you and deliver it to your house. Help me, Holy Spirit. Don't you know, they came up with SHIP, and so they got on the SHIP app, and people could go and actually shop for you and deliver it to your house, and you never had to leave your home. Then Target came up with an on-store, walk-in traditional concept for those who have nothing to do on a Saturday, nothing to do on a Sunday, but uh, a Sunday afternoon, but just want to stroll through the store. So they kept that option as well. When I saw that, I said, my gracious, that is a plan for growth in the church. Because here's the deal. What if the church took seriously their curbside service? What is our curbside service? Our curbside service is training families in the midst of a pandemic to disciple each other and their communities. That is the new growth of the church. We've got to learn how to train our leaders and our officers and our ministers and our ushers and our greeters how now to take what you get here in the sanctuary and take it home to you and disciple your family members and your friends and your communities. That's our curbside service for growth. But then not only that, but we ought to have our own shift. What is our shift? Our shift is the use of digital means to stay connected and have our needs met. Can I tell you that digital means and, and social media is not going anywhere. So those of you who are fighting social media and technology, you're going to be left behind. You're in a pandemic all by yourself because it's not going anywhere. Now, matter of fact, we're going to have to become hybrid. We're going to have to have online worship as, as many already do. And we're going to have to, watch this, do in-store or in-church worship as well. So that when the doors are open, you may be able to download a worship 
Or you may be able to come into worship and say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord where our feet shall dwell within thy gates. Oh, Jerusalem. What I'm trying to tell you is we can take what Target did, put a little Holy Spirit on it, a little prayer on it and use the same strategy and it can be impactful for the church. There comes a time when the church must look at something that's going on somewhere else and apply it to our own reality. But I'm almost done. But growth must also be collective. In this new season, cool won't cut it. Hype won't cut it and fun won't cut it. But we got have, we're going to have to be real if we're going to reach this new generation. And I believe in transparency. Now, I don't believe in ecclesiastical nudity. I believe some people get too transparent before their healing, and so we lose more people than we draw them. But I do believe that we're going to have to learn how to keep it real and be transparent. Growth must be collected. That means everybody must take part in the growth process. Um, there is one leadership principle that I'd like to share with you. And one once said that if there are 10 people in the boat, then you can expect 10 people that's rowing in the boat, three will be rowing with you, five will have their paddles on the lap, and two will be trying to sink the boat. Can I tell you that in this season, we need more helping us to row this boat. That this is not the time for you to sit back and say, well, because we're not in worship, if because we're not in traditional church, that we don't have anything to do. No, we need you helping to row the boat. But then those of you who have the paddles on your lap, I need you to pick up your paddles and I need you to pray about where you're going to be involved as we move forward in the kingdom of God. What are you going to do with all that's happening around us? What are you going to do with your paddle? But then those two, that's trying to sink the ship. I want you to know that the hand of the Lord is against you. And whatever you try to do to tear down any ministry or any vision that's sown into this ministry, I want you to know that the hand of the Lord is against you and you shall not prosper. This is not the season that we have people around us or we need people around us trying to sink our ship. But we need everybody rowing and everybody working. So then I want you to know that there are some growth gaps that we must get over. The intentional gap where we believe that everything has uh, to be um, uh, that, that, that excellent in its way. Yes, we believe in excellence and understand that excellence uh, has to happen in the ministry. But there are times when ministry is rugged. And that there are times when you got to move and be fluid with where ministry is moving and, and let God work it out and, and while you figure it out. Are you hearing me? There's the perfection gap. There are some people who never grow because they say, I must have everything perfect before I do what I need to do. Can I tell you, there is not a season where everything in your life is going to line up where it needs to. As soon as one thing get in line, here comes something else out of kilter. As soon as you get that in line, here comes something else out of kilter. So you got to learn how to balance. And you got to learn how to function when things are not just like you want them to be. There's a traditional uh, gap where we, some people say, well, since it's been this way all the time, let's just leave it this way. This is a new season. We just overcame or we're coming through a pandemic. Nothing is the same. So we need you to make the shift. Would you please put that in the chat box somewhere and tell somebody to make the shift? Can I tell you there's a comparison gap where you constantly compare yourself with someone else? I want you to know that you don't need to spend another minute comparing your gift with somebody else's gift. God has given you a gift to help this ministry grow. God has given you a gift to help your family grow. That's why you got to stop looking in your neighbor's house and check your own house and thank God for what he has given you. There's the expectation gap where we put limits 
on God. But I, I can tell you that God will supersede your limit if you open up and walk by faith and not by sight. And then there's the mistake gap where many people don't ever grow because they're afraid of making mistakes. I wish I could tell you that in this life you won't ever make mistakes, but some of the greatest accomplishments in this world have happened by people who have made mistakes. So let us now conclude and move forward. Uh, everyone has something to do in this growth process. The pastor's role, if you look at that screen there, the pastor's role is to continue to speak vision and to talk about us moving forward. That is the pastor's role. The deacons and stewards should be contacting families and making sure that families are okay and that when we are back in place, that they are also coming when we return. And then intercessors should be praying up the sanctuary. Praise teams and choirs should be practicing and rehearsing new music, if not in person, by way of Zoom. Social media teams should always be coming up with new marketing strategies to help the growth of the church and the development of the church. Ushers and greeters and health ministries should be reviewing COVID protocol and keeping the church safe and healthy for when we do meet and when we come together. Evangelism teams should have food items and resources ready because people are going to be calling on the church and the church membership should be uh, working by supporting and by giving and sowing into this ministry. I want to conclude by saying that there are some growth requirements and some language that we should be speaking, some things that we should remember as we're growing. One, I want you to remember this, that growing Christians grow into the conversations that they engage and entertain. That in this season, you got to have the right people around you speaking into your ear gate, keeping you encouraged and lifted up as we continue to grow as the body of Christ. We may not be together in one place at one time, but collectively, if we all speak those things that be not as though they were, we grow together. Growing Christians are either on the menu or at the table. You're either an option or you recognize you're chosen. Help me, Holy Ghost. As long as you're on the menu, you're just an option. I walk into a restaurant night right now and I look at the, the menu, I have options. But when I make my selection, I enjoy what I chose. Can I tell you that you got to start seeing yourself not as an option, but as a chosen one. That God has chosen you in a season for such a time as this. Growing Christians should never apologize for standard. If people want to be around you, they will rise to your level. Aren't you tired of just dumbing down yourself and playing down what God is doing in your life? Aren't you tired of settling for less? You're a growing Christian. You're a growing saint. And that there are some things you need to leave behind. If people are talking behind your back, they're behind you for a reason. <laughs> they're behind you for a reason. They don't even deserve to be in your same weight class. And can I tell you that growing Christians, if you lower your standards, you lose winners. But if you raise your standards, you lose losers. Don't ever forget that. And I want you to rest in knowing that as a church, as the body of Christ, we will continue to grow and develop those foundational principles for church growth in a pandemic. God bless you. Don't forget to go out there and order your book uh, before you go to the hospital uh, by Mother Frances Jones Mack. And hold on to this teaching and may it be a blessing to your life. God bless you and I love you. Anybody want to press a little further? Anybody want to press a little further? Somebody lift your voice into the Lord. Tell them, God, I want to press a little further. Press in your presence, Jesus. Presence, behold the beauty of your face. If I can just.
First of all, we want to thank you so much for your generous support so that we can continue to operate in excellence. The following are ways to give tithes and offerings using technology. Use the Push Pay app or go to giving page on the Union Baptist website. Use the Cash app, which is dollar sign UBC 1200 trade. Use the Givelify app. 
Union Baptist Church, Winston-Salem. For Rise Up Giving, please use the designated cash app. Dollar sign, Union Baptist, Rise Up. If you don't use technology for giving, you may bring your tithes, offering, and Rise Up campaign payments on Sundays from 10 a.m. till noon. Envelopes will be available, or you can mail checks only. No cash, only checks to 1200 North Trade Street, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 27101. Download Monday Morning MP3 Mana for an inspirational message. It can be accessed on our website, YouTube, and Facebook. Attend the Zoom Church this week. The daily schedule is listed on the website. To our virtual church, if you need prayer or would like to join the church, please visit the Connect page on our website. We are pleased to introduce MindSight Counseling Services. Please call the church office at 336-724-9305 to schedule an appointment. To those of you celebrating a birthday, Day this week. We pray that you will have a blessed birthday. Remember to protect yourself and stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask, get tested, and stay safe.